Well, welcome everyone to the show here. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas, for joining us today. Uh, we're going to do a AMA first ever with uh, you on the show, yes? That All it right. is. All right. I tend to avoid <laughs> these things, actually. So, <laughs> you know, the idea that, uh, of wanting to listen to a chief legal officer uh, on an AMA is a little bit scary to me. Uh, that means everyone else is as brain damaged as we are, Brian, or, <laughs> you know, we're just running out of fun topics. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think a lot of people are looking forward to this today. I was looking forward to meeting you today. Um, get a sneak peek into the uh, behind the scenes at Chia Network. And um, if you would just take a minute here and introduce yourself, uh, Thomas, what's your uh, education and, and background? Sure. So for those of you who have not met me, I'm Thomas Chow. I am the Chief Legal Officer here at Chia Network, Inc. My background is a little bit varied. Uh, I've been and done a little bit of everything. Um, I actually started as an IT person well before I went to law school. Um, for those of you who remember dial-up internet in the 90s, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. my high school, screeching now. <laughs> so my high school job uh, was actually doing tech support at Earthlink which was an ISP based in Pasadena and it was trying to take on America online. And so um, worked through college, put myself, helped put myself through college as a IT and systems network administrator and uh, systems architect, did a little bit of database administration, but I try not to talk about that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just have been techie through and through. Uh, I ended up going to law school at a place that is now known as UC Law San Francisco. Uh, the former name was Hastings, but it got renamed recently, and it's still, uh, it, it's hard for me to call it UC Law SF. I'm just not used to it, and I think all the old school attorneys are used to calling their law schools by the original name. So Hastings for mine, like if you went to Berkeley Law, people are used to use, used to calling it Bolt, et cetera. Uh, again, you know, a lot of renames, a lot of rebranding, uh, so cooler new logos, uh, but that's where I went to law school, graduated law school in 2004, so I've been practicing about 20 years now. And I started off as a litigator, I switched into corporate, and then I went in-house after I got laid off in the Great Recession of 2008 and have been very happy as an in-house counsel, have done a little bit of everything, have uh, done some stints in e-commerce, social media, fintech, ad tech, and here I am back in blockchain and fintech. So uh, <laughs> been around the block and I can delve into you know, some of the stories later, but that's the high level overview. That's awesome. So not too many lawyers um, get into this realm. And in fact, most people who uh, have a background in tech don't become lawyers. So what was it where you made that transition where you're like, you know what, I'm a tech guy, but I'm going to go into law school. How did that happen? So I'm one of those people who thought that it'd be fun to try to learn new things. So I went to Cal Berkeley for my undergrad degree. I started off as a computer science major, and that's because I just thought I was going to be a techie like everyone else. I was going to play in Silicon Valley, and that would be my home. And uh, the one thing I didn't expect about Berkeley's computer science program was that it would be 99.99% focused on coding and programming, and there wasn't really anything practical on information systems, networking, and the stuff that I actually enjoyed about computer science and computer technology, um, full disclosure, I can code. I am horrible at it. It just does not come naturally to me. And so it really is trying to take my brain, you know, taking it and, and fitting a, a square peg in a round hole. And it just hurts. And so once I realized that uh, Berkeley computer science was like that, I figured, well, I, I can still work in tech. Everyone in Silicon Valley works in tech. They're musicians on the side and they work in tech. And so why can't I do that? Figured I, I would then get myself uh, a well-rounded liberal arts education because how many Renaissance men are left in our world nowadays? <laughs> Almost none. So I figured, I, I don't know where I got this idea, but I figured I'm going to be a Renaissance man. So I majored in sociology uh, because I love the study of society. I love the, the study of organizations, power structures, authority, and in my work in sociology, I ended up studying a lot about law. And that was also about when some of the biggest uh, 
early technology cases were coming down the pike. So Sun versus Microsoft one and two, um, the Microsoft, the US versus Microsoft antitrust cases around the yeah. Internet Explorer browser and yeah. wiping out Netscape that way. Um, these were just fun things that, I, that, that were coming down. And when I realized that law didn't really have great answers for the tech, it didn't have great answers for the internet, frankly, at the time, uh, I figured, well, I understand both sides and I'm studying sociology. I enjoy law. I tidbit, I actually did speech and debate in high school because I liked it. And so I figured, why not just marry all of these interests, you know, and become a tech lawyer. And so that was where I got that, that funny idea. And I never thought I would be a blockchain tech lawyer. Uh, I always figured I'd work for some big tech companies until I discovered that I preferred startups. But that's where I got the idea. Let, maybe I would get into law school, start working on tech and legal policy. You know, no one knew what to do with the internet at the time. Maybe I could shed a better understanding than lawmakers who are um, just not technical experts or, you know, even frankly, not even in touch really with the state of basic technology. A lot of times, not to mention the state of the art. And so, why not? And so that that was a little bit of my thinking. You know, it, it wasn't probably the best thinking I've done, but uh, look, uh, that was my college thinking. And college thinking is when you have fun ideas and try new things. <laughs> That's awesome, man. You're like uh, my brother from another mother because uh, our stories are very parallel <laughs> time wise and everything. <laughs> you coded too, and 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 like I said, that's that's rare for for an attorney. Um, yeah which, you know, probably makes people think that you're a little bit crazy inside, but <laughs> look, I, I feel that way all the time. <laughs> that's that's wow. great. So then, okay, so you went into um, law and at some point you made a transition where you, you thought, let's go in the direction of blockchain. And when did that switch happen? You know, it happened right before I joined Chia and it was not a switch that I was planning. Um, so. My experience with blockchain was, I remember when Satoshi's white paper first came out and Ryan, I think, you know, you, you would understand this and I'm not sure that other people necessarily would, but when I read the white paper, my thought was not, wow, this is new global currency. How are we going to get rich off of this thing? <laughs> um, you know, the thing that, that came through my mind was wow, this is a productive use of all of my extra compute cycles, which I can use on a DSL or dial-up. And this is basically a more productive use than SETI at home. Um, <laughs> and look, I mean, I, I was a SETI fan. I can't say I gave a lot of my cycles to it, but you know, every tech geek knew SETI at home. Every tech geek knew like what it was to have distributed computing there. And then to actually have it channeled to a productive use case, was revolutionary. Like, you know, yes, like I, I wasn't technical enough to start nerding out on, wow, he, you know, Satoshi solved the Byzantine generals problem. Wow. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, look, that is cool, but it was more the productive use in, in, in Bitcoin that I thought was really, really fascinating. And so I read that. Uh, I did want to start mining at that point. Uh, I'll tell you that the, the, the the UI was horrible and uh, mining didn't really last for me after that, but, you know, got really fascinated with the technology there. I thought that was really cool. Uh, I watched the ICO boom, you know, Ethereum and everyone else happen. Um, mm -hmm. At that point, I was already a practicing attorney and had done both litigation and corporate. So I'd already been, a, 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 a you know, I don't want to say seasoned corporate attorney, but at least, you know, a mid-level corporate attorney. And so when I saw the ICO boom coming around, I'm thinking, You've got to be kidding me. This is all securities registration violations, um, unregistered securities offerings, you know, because that's what they sounded like to me. Uh, and so I actually did not follow the rest of blockchain tech after that. I just looked at the rest of it and said, this generally is get rich quick stuff. I don't care for it. Uh, and I kind of left it like that. Um, you know, I, I, watched meme coins happen. I kind of laughed about those because I thought they were funny, but I couldn't believe people would actually try to make a fortune off of it. And so, you know, as I watched stuff over the years, I I just couldn't get interested in anything else. And what happened was uh, I had taken my last company public. So I was the general counsel at Pubmatic um, 
you know, got to actually hit a, you know, hit a double or a triple or a home run, depending on how you classify it. But on a startup, which I got to take through the IPO process as the general counsel through a legal team, uh, you know, had been in ad tech at that point, in nine years and felt, you know, I'd, I'd like to learn something new. I'd like to try different things. And so I was open to opportunities. And that's when Gene called me and said, why don't you come work for me in the crypto company? I've always wanted to start. And I started laughing at him and said, ha ha ha, very funny. No, uh, me and crypto don't really get along because I've watched crypto now and I've watched Ethereum and I've watched every other altcoin in the world, promise, over promise, under deliver, you know, not really be decentralized, decentralization name only, decentralization and governance only. You know, I just, I was not interested, um, but it was because Gene called me up and I dug in and I talked with Bram and I talked with the, some of the other executives at Chia and said, wait, they actually might have something real here. Um, maybe I can do this thing. But it, so it was basically pulling me back to the the interest I had from the original Bitcoin white paper um, and not kind of the rest of the madness. So, you know, I, I, I will confess that I don't have as deep of an understanding uh, of every other ecosystem that I think some others do. You know, I, I get into uh, interesting discussions with other attorneys who just love, eat and breathe EVM and EVM compatible chains. I don't uh, for some obvious reasons. But anyway, th that that was kind of the migration was falling in love with blockchain as an idea early on and now actually seeing a possible production worthy use system, you know, platform and use case system everything happened in the Chia network, figured, okay, maybe I'll join that. So that that's kind of how I got here in the first place. And I can get well into it. But wow. That that's so, that's where I started. That's that's a cool story. So you kind of saw the writing on the wall early, early on about the legal challenges that would be facing a lot of the blockchains as far as securities laws and so forth. I mean, it took a while for that to come to fruition with with some like the Ripple case and stuff like that, right? It, it it really did. Look, I mean, now it's funny because in the last three years or so, I think every major law firm, you know, when I think major, I'm talking like Amlaw 100, 200. So all the white shoe prestigious firms, they all have blockchain practices now. And they all have people who are very deep in crypto, or at least maybe not very deep in crypto, but deep enough. And who are all now willing to say, there is regulatory uncertainty. There's no clarity. Tokens are, you know, digital assets are are are, are a different asset class altogether, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, they wouldn't say that five years ago, and you know, five six years ago, the only people who were, not the only, but it was basically small solo practitioners, boutiques, and two major Silicon Valley law firms that were willing to sign off on SEOs and come up with what's now known as the playbook for you know, how to have a token offering. And this is stuff that the average securities lawyer at the time was thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I, this is basically legal engineering around securities regulation. And it involves, you know, really at the end of the day, what it involves is decentralization of organization and corporate governance. So if, you know, everything else runs the same. You've just scattered control of a blockchain and an op, you know, an opco or a devco, and you've thrown it over three, four, ten different entities, and you and you call that decentralization. And I, that, I'm not a fan of that. I'm I'm really not. And so, it's those law firms which will not be named that pioneered that that playbook that now everyone sings from because obviously crypto has gotten too big. It really is too big to fail at this point. Uh, and so that's why every law firm is now trying to make money off of it, like those first couple of law firms were. Uh, but to me, the whole ICO craze was 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 nuts. It really never should have happened. And you know, the amount of looks that I think the securities lawyers and the non-securities lawyers uh, have for each other, like, it, it, you know, there, there's a certain amount of dissonance in how they view the world. And sometimes it spills over to their arguments and the, kind of the evil eyes that they give each other uh, about whether it's a, there's a Section 5 violation or not. Um, and so my view of blockchain law is actually probably a little bit different than a lot of other people. Like, I don't think you can actually be a 
blockchain law expert because there really is no such thing as blockchain law. Like yeah. all the things that are in tech law. And so the corporate and securities aspect that are, that a company tokens or securities and equity or the data privacy issues that come with data privacy and, and uh, data privacy and data protection regulations. Uh, you know, the stuff that comes with uh, copyright, trademark, um, data ownership, you know, very complex data licensing agreements, all that stuff already exists in tech. Blockchain is, is a very different sort of application of how the tech looks and some of the use cases. And so you actually have to bring in all of the very traditional general areas of legal practice into blockchain. And it's just a new use case. And so people who say that I'm a crypto law expert, uh, you know, I, I have a hard time believing that not because I don't think people are, are familiar with, with certain, you know, types of blockchains and crypto technologies. I think there are, but generally like crypto law is not something yet. You know, I think Hopefully one day not it will on be... the bar exam, right? Not on our California. Oh bar no. <laughs> and look, one day will Congress will get its act together and actually pass something. But until then, there is no digital asset law really on the books. Like we're still relying on financial regulation. We're relying on, you know, AML, you know, anti-money laundering and know your customer sort of laws. We're looking at money transmitter licenses, stuff that are that that is still in play in traditional finance comes into blockchain, obviously. And so that's the kind of thing. I, that's why I don't really think there's something that's called blockchain law, or at least there shouldn't be, because uh, it's it's both a oversimplification and I think, frankly, a misunderstanding of what, what the legal practice is anyway, which is there are different facets. Like, you know, Brian, you, you're, you know, you know the workers' comp stuff in and out, and I'm sure you know a few other areas too. And so the things that you know are not going to be the same things that I know. And if either one of us starts saying, you know, look at me, I'm Mr. Crypto lawyer, like, you know, people who come to us for legal advice, you know, clients are going to get misled because what you know, what I know, what attorneys know, like our, our regions, our, our areas of specialty, even if we know a lot of things still, like there's no way we know everything. And so that's why I hesitate to say crypto blockchain law. Yeah, yeah. Very good overview, though. Um, so when you were in law school, did they have any electives or something where you got mastery over securities law? Because I didn't even take securities law type of class. You know, uh, I did not take enough securities regulations classes. I There was a securities regulation class. I, admittedly, I did not take it because it was actually known to be the hardest class at least. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, once I had gotten a taste of litigation, I actually thought I was going to be a litigator for the rest of my career. And so, you know, that, that's why the first few years out of law school, I was a litigator and I loved it. I liked taking and defending depositions and writing my own briefs and arguing my own motions. Like I, I do like that stuff. And so, um, you know, the, the electives I took were either litigation focused or IP focused because I thought, you know, IP is kind of cool. Um, now I, I've, I've come to know that like IP and I don't always get along, but, um, <laughs> You know, and that's more, it, it's not because I, I don't think there's some strategy involved, but, you know, some of the philosophical ideas in, in IP are, in, in my mind, perhaps questionable. Um, but things. look, yeah. I mean, so I, I did most of my electives in practical litigation stuff or IP. There was no blockchain law. I do think it's really cool that law schools have those electives now. My one concern is that people, law school law students are going to walk away thinking that there is something called blockchain law. And yeah. as I said earlier... There really isn't like, you know, understanding what a native token is for a system is different than understanding what the use case will be later, which is different than what happens to my data if it's all being published out there on a public blockchain, you know, and what is censorship, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was researching because I wanted to kind of uh, get sharper in this area of law myself. And I was seeing if there was any publications or treatises that have been published published and uh, Lexus had one. It was like a $500 book called Blockchain Law and Technology. Like that. So yeah, that's, that, that book's going to be outdated in six months. So maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just Google it. I don't know. That it is. Look, you know, the best way to get yourself educated in, in a lot of things is just, it really is trial by error and by doing. And I really do think there is some amount of the, this particular legal practice that you're never going to understand until you delve into the issue. And then when you once you delve in, that's when you're asking questions going, wait, you've architected like this. 
why how does that make sense or okay maybe it doesn't make sense but why would we do it this way and then you realize well you know this smart contract is actually very centralized well who who holds control of it oh the multi-sig does how many people have a multi-sig it's a four of seven who do our employees and directors and officers have access to those keys yeah they have a majority of them okay you know i mean that's the kind of like level that you have to delve into to understand like is there ownership here or control and you know and I, I get into some very fun debates with some of the other crypto uh, focused attorneys about like property rights. And this mm. is stuff that I haven't looked at since law school. Like what is yeah. the bundle of rights that accompanies <laughs> real property? And yeah. for, for those of you who are not, uh, who are, who are not attorneys or even have an interest in going to law school who are listening in real property refers to property. That's more or less what we know as real estate now. Um, you know, there's personal property, which are small items, you know, personal belongings. And then there's real property, which is land and water rights and things like that. Uh, and so uh, unfortunately, you know, Brian and I have been subjected to at least one semester or a year uh, of kind of damaging our our, our mind and real property. <laughs> and the rule of property. But that being said, you know, the idea of property as being a bundle of rights, like we get into some philosophical debates about what is like the, the the bundle of rights that you have when you own a key that unlocks a unspent transaction on Bitcoin, yes. is that property or not? Yes. And there's a lot of argument about that. And, you know, there is not a clear answer. And I don't think there's a clear answer because the it's the, the Bitcoin network has coins on it, ha has coins and the, the coins, who owns it? It's kind of hard to say who, where ownership is. It's really about control. And therefore control is in the private key, but how many people actually have the private key? And like, yeah. therefore, if you have the private key, do you have an ownership right or not? And it's kind of a weird question. Um, it is. So, you know, we, we end mean, up, I, yeah. I've been obsessed with this, uh, you know, crypto and law, the intersection with taxation and assets. Oh like, boy. That, that's a huge ball of wax right there. Uh, I remember Chia had this early stage where it was, like mind blowing to figure out what to do from a legal perspective when we couldn't sell it, like mainnet launched and we couldn't sell XEH. So if we received XEH, did it have a zero, you know, market value at that time? Uh, <laughs> but people were speculating and trading these IOUs for like, you know, 1600 bucks. So, you know, how's the IRS, you know, going to define what is an asset when it hits your wallet? I don't know. <laughs> yep. Yeah, like that. Yeah. I mean, no one has an answer for that yet. The IRS has one answer and, you know, FinCEN might have another. And look, it's it, it really is all over the map. And gosh, I mean, the tax stuff, I literally on Sunday woke up to 150 Telegram messages uh, of this lawyer chat I'm part of where people were arguing about the taxation uh, oh. of assets. And the, the argument was, if you have ETH, and then you end up, you know, transferring it to wrapped, you know, you know, transferring it, you know, making a swap to wrapped ETH. Is that a taxable event or not? And they were arguing about is ETH different than wrapped ETH based on the bundle of rights versus, of ETH versus not versus wrapped ETH. And I'm thinking, guys, it's Sunday. I I just <laughs> went to baseball practice and not think about this. Uh, but this is the stuff that goes on because there aren't there aren't clear answers on this yet. If you wrap your Tesla, is it still a Tesla? <laughs> <laughs> no comment on that one. <laughs> All right. So let's go then back to it. Uh, so Gene ropes you in. You're into Chia now. And uh, you're the, the chief legal officer for the company, right? And so what do you find yourself doing? Like if you had to summarize the top three things, three things that you spend most of your mental energy and time on uh, within work for CNI, what would you say are those top three things? So I would say the first thing is really public company readiness. You know, that is the bread and butter. And I, I'd like to think the main reason Gene hired me. Um, well, actually, no, that's the second reason he hired me. The main reason I think is because he actually liked me when we worked together in the past. And he, he thought I was cool enough and smart enough, hopefully. Um, at least I like to think think and tell myself that. So that way I feel like I belong. <laughs> um, but um, no, uh, you know, my main skill set is, to, you know, because I took Pubmatic Public in 2020. And I actually took Pubmatic Public in 14 weeks. 
you know, like it was a crazy, crazy process. Um, you know, it's bringing that skill set back into taking a company public and then getting it ready for life as a public company. Earnings reports, you know, which is quarterly, you know, having to train and educate employees on, on, on insider trading and equity and how to actually deal with RSUs, all that jazz and the cultural shift. And so I, I think that's the, the main thing I'm focused on. Um, the other two things I'm probably focused on next are, uh, I'd say number two is more policy and government relations. You know, there's always new legislation being proposed. You know, there's many others in the industry. And this is where I know the industry looks very, um, very fragmented. And we are in some ways. But I will say the, a lot of the legal and policy folks are actually not that fragmented. We do do a lot of collaboration together whether through blockchain association or, you know, crypto council for innovation or other, other industry associations, or just even amongst ourselves, we do collaborate a lot. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about policy stuff. I will say I'm not as active in DC as I thought I would be, but that's because Congress is more broken and therefore it's not the best use of my time, but I still have to be up to date on those things. So following a lot of policy. And I'd say the last thing I'm probably focused on after that is um, really just keeping the lights on at CNI. And so, uh, that's mostly contract work, uh, NDAs, contracts, client contracts, you know, partnerships, just a little bit of everything. Uh, but you know, I'd say those are the top three, but look, you catch me on a single day. I, it, one day will not look anything like, like the one before. And I know that wigs out some attorneys who wants a little bit more certainty and rigidity in their schedule. I happen to not be one of them. And so I like the variety and think it's a lot of fun. And that's why I've been drawn to startups for much of my career. Uh, but those are the, the three things I focus on. All right. Well, you just uh, touched on things that I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper with you. So um, now let's let's touch on this topic of um, going public, right? The IPO. So we know those of us in Discord, <laughs> so it's a running joke. Uh, we say when, when IPO, when, when the announcement, when the news. And uh, we also know that there's a quiet period. We, this is not something that Chia can talk about until they can talk about it. So what can you tell us, uh, the viewers and those curious about the IPO process? What are we allowed to know and what are we not allowed to know? And then the reasons behind it, like the legal reasons, just from a really high level. Sure. Look, I can't say much. I really wish I could. Um, I think all I could say is we're in dialogue with the SEC. Um, I can't give any details about where we are with our filings. Um, there will be a day that our filings, well, hopefully there will be a day that our filings get flipped public. Um, and when when they are, uh, that is something that I actually expect the, the community to comb through you know, very carefully, very closely, and, and and try to look for some of the nuggets and search for Easter eggs and just, you know, have a good time actually pouring through legal documents, which most people normally wouldn't do. Um, but um, look, there, there really isn't much we can say. And uh, the reason for that is this all goes back to the you know securities regulations and in particular the Securities Act of 1933. And so um, the Securities Act of 1933 uh, regulates, you know, it it gives the SEC the ability <clears throat> to make sure that when there's a public offering of stock, it's done in a very proper way. And you know, so if you do not follow the Securities Act of 33, uh, most of the time you're going to be violating Section Five, which is basically like how to actually do an offering. And so the SEC reads the idea of an offering very very broadly. And, you know, you would think maybe it, it, it should get updated. You know, uh, I, I, this is getting way beyond my pay grade because I am not someone who knows markets that well. Um, you know, I do know markets. I've done, I've been involved in them, but I don't consider myself a market expert. But so generally the idea is when a company wants to go public and sell its stock to the public, uh, retail investors, they do it through a document known as prospectus. And the prospectus, you know, uh, it's done on a form S1. And so that's why a lot of people call it the S1. Uh, we call it the S1 as well. And so that is basically a 100, 200, 300 page document 
that outlines the company's financial condition. You know, it, it'll contain our revenue, our EBITDA profitability, our net income or loss. It will also uh, have a very detailed description of our business and you know, how we make money, how our business works. Uh, and it has a very, very detailed description of risk factors, which is all the things that could possibly go wrong if you buy our stock, which is, you know, should be common sense, but sometimes it's not like people just expect, oh, if I buy stock, it's going to go up. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, there's plenty of reasons why it won't go up. Like say the internet goes down and World War Three happens and a bunch of other terrible things happen. Yes, companies will get messed up and, you know, therefore the, the value of your stock is going to go down. And so uh, every company needs to disclose those risk factors. And so that long document is known as prospectus. And when a company is selling its stock, everything is supposed to be in that prospectus and nothing is supposed to be extraneous or outside of that prospectus. And so that's why, why the SEC, when, when people start doing media interviews, and I'm thinking about the Google interview with Playboy, for example, or you know, things like that. Like you know, Larry and Sergey did an interview with Playboy and ended up like, because they were talking about things that may not have been the prospectus, like they actually had to refile and include like the entire Playboy article in their prospectus, you know, <laughs> uh, stuff like that. You know, the SEC takes us a very, a very, very broad view of, of, of what an offering is. And that's why we have to be super careful about what we say, or frankly, any company trying to go through public, go to public has to say. And there are different periods of different periods of uh, what happens in the IPO process. There's a, a period where, at, you know, phase one is when you are going through the process, but you have not publicly made your prospectus available. At that point, you're, you know, you can't really talk too much about your process. You can only basically say we're in a process like which we've done. Um, and that's really it. And we can still, as a company, do business as usual. We can still make product announcements. We can make Mark, you know, we can still do basic marketing as long as we're not doing things that would, uh, uh, you know, prejudice investors or, you know, be material enough to constitute something that should or shouldn't be in the prospectus. You know, that's the tripwire. When, if and when a company in phase two flips that public and they're about to start their roadshow and actually, you know, start, start filling out an order book for, for their shares with, re with institutional investors or even retail, um, that is when they move into the the, the 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 waiting period or the quiet period, and at that point, the you know this is a, a lawyerly way of thinking of things. The best point is actually to say nothing at that point. <laughs> you just let the prospectus speak for itself, and hopefully, you don't make any product announcements then. Um, and then after you're public, then you are then you are subject to uh, quarterly reporting and Reg FD or Regulation Financial Disclosure which is like if you uh, if you have anything you know that you are going to disclose to investors, you have to do it publicly and in a form that all investors can see. And so that's often through a press release or a filing with the SEC or both. Uh, and so you have to go through those. And so depending on where you are in that stage of going to be, you know, uh, uh, going through phase one, going through the IPO process, phase two, you flip public, you're actually trying to actively get your investors or phase three, you've actually gone public. Uh, there are different requirements and different things that you can or can't say. And so it gets complex. That's the high level. I've probably got a little bit too more too much into the weeds for your question, Brian, but I, I do think it's helpful for people to understand like those are the things that are top of mind for me. Um, and as a result, I wish I could share more. I love our community. You all ask really good questions. Uh, and I wish that Gene or Misha or I could share more answers. But because we don't want to trip up our, our, our process with the SEC, that's why it's always, mm, you know, can't say much. We're on file. That's really it. Got it. Are you ever a fly on the wall on our Discord where you see us chattering? <laughs> Actually am. Uh, I don't know if people know that, uh, that, that I do check it. I can't say I'm on. There, there was a time I was monitoring it more closely, but yeah. uh, I am part of Discord. I will hop into, uh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll skim through announcements. I will browse through Chia General sometimes. Uh, every once in a while, if things are spicy, another channel, I'll, I'll hop in there. Uh, and for those of you who are who, who happen to be mods, know that I'm also in that room too. So I do jump in and out of the channels. Okay. All right. He's watching from a distance, you guys. <laughs> 
Um, all right, so the next uh, sub question, um, let's see. So <clears throat> you talked about NDAs when uh, that's another thing that you deal with inside of Chia. A lot of us, myself included, have been really obnoxious asking when Coinbase, <laughs> which is a tier one exchange in the US, and we're very eager to uh, hopefully someday get you know better on and off ramps through a centralized exchange like Coinbase, because we just trust it more than some of these other smaller ones. Um, it, it's come to light through a lot of these back and forth discussions on the Discord that there are NDAs that cover even um, the application once you you put that out there. So can you touch on a high level what you can say about that to maybe uh, you know squash? We can point to this video in the future and say this is why we're not talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> you know I'm not going to be squashing anything once you look at the video people are going to be asking even more questions <laughs> fortunately um there's really not much I can say about the tier one listings uh I I can say we we do speak with all the you know we we do speak with or have tried to speak with each of the major exchanges um maybe not every one of them but most of them for sure Coinbase included uh, my answer to when Coinbase is uh, I don't know. Ask Coinbase. <laughs> um, because uh, at the end of the day, Coinbase's listing process is it's their listing process and their listing team is very independent of, uh, uh, of their legal team. So it's not like I can reach out to Paul Graywall, uh, who I know and say, Hey, Paul, when's it happening? Uh, because you know, the, the, the listing team is, is very walled off over there. I, I don't have an answer for you. Um, and it's not because of the NDAs. Yes, there, there are things I can't disclose in, that were that you know that Coinbase has asked us in particular. Um, but end of the day, I even if I could share those things with, with with all of you, I don't think they would actually answer many questions for you. Um, you know, most of the exchanges generally um, will do an evaluation of whether your token is a security or not, and whether they can list it and Almost every exchange uses a modified version of what's uh, of a framework that was developed by the Crypto Ratings Council a long time ago. And so Coinbase, I believe, has a matrix that's similar to the Crypto Ratings Council matrix. And I believe every other one does as well. Um, how they fill it out based off of your listing application answers is uh, more art than science to me. And it's a black box. And so I don't know what, what happens and how they've rated us. Uh, they've never told us. Uh, and frankly, we've never asked either because that's just not typically a discussion that happens. You give them the answers and then you work with them. Uh, and that's, that's really it. So uh, Coinbase does that. They do their evaluation. And then they have their business considerations for who, who to list and when. And that is completely a black box to us as well. And so. That's why I, we don't have a great answer for when Coinbase. Uh, and I keep telling people, go ask Coinbase or bug Coinbase. Um, you know, uh, you know, maybe they'll listen to the community, but uh, certainly there's not much we can do on top of providing them information that's detailed and accurate and complete, which we, we which we've done multiple times. Okay, I think that right there just answers a lot of questions for people. Like, uh, where is CNI at in the application process? If you say, well. I can tell you we've applied and uh, now we don't know <laughs> what's next. I mean, that that answers the question. I guess another question then would be, do you believe it would be beneficial and helpful for Chia to be actually listed if more community members kept asking, asking Coinbase? <laughs> like, hey. You know, I say it's somewhat tongue in cheek. Honestly, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't know what drives the Coinbase listing team. Um, I'd like to think that a community could help, but you know, look, Coinbase is going to make their own decisions, and they're a public company with certain revenue goals and, and profitability goals to meet. They're going to make decisions regardless of whether the Chia community or any other ecosystem like the XRP army comes and starts hounding them or not. So uh, I don't know if it's helpful. I just kind of throw that out as you know, look, maybe it would help, but uh, if you're going to go bug Coinbase, please. Do it nicely. Don't be obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't don't troll. Don't troll Coinbase. All right. That's fair. Um, 
Okay, so we talked about the NDAs. Uh, okay, international laws. So there, there's a lot of international stuff going on right now. And I had someone, one of the community members on our Discord private message me from another country in the European Union where they're coming out with um, certain regulations that could intersect with Chia. Um, are you having to pay attention to that stuff as it evolves in the EU for um, Chia's compliance there, um, you know, listings on exchanges to be traded there and so forth? So the answer is yes. Um, I definitely do pay attention to the international stuff. I am not as well versed in it. Um, and that's partially a fault of my own. And frankly, that's more because I just don't have enough hours in the day to, you know, really go through all the regulations that are out there. Um, you know, I've scrolled through through Mika before, um, you know, just to, at least to, to be able to be relatively educated. Uh, when people are having high-level discussions on Mika and why it's superior or inferior, um, most people conclude it's superior. I I look at that and say, you know, for us, it really wouldn't have changed much anyway. And so for Chia, it's neutral. Um, you know, so I pay attention to it. But the reason why I'm not as focused on it is, number one, I'm a U.S. lawyer, so I'm, I'm biased. But, you know, but more importantly, the U.S., like it or not, the U.S. is kind of the, the dominant player in the financial institutions of the globe. Um, you know, many of the bulge brackets are based in the U.S. and they're U.S. companies. And so what those banks will do in the future will determine what happens with crypto. And so I am more focused on the U.S., both because of that and because the U.S. is the most stringent on its securities regulations. There are a few other jurisdictions that I think classify most token, many tokens, possibly as securities, you know, Canada is one, for example, but um, the US is the most stringent. Um, they really are the cop on the beat for, for, for a lot of these, for a lot of the, the use cases around equity securities. And so look, if you're gonna comply globally, best and easiest to comply with the most stringent regulator and then kind of work your way backwards. And that was my approach, even with like privacy law and GDPR, for example, like the EU was the most stringent with GDPR when, it, when they passed it and it took effect in, in 18. And so when I was in ad tech, obviously we're all targeted by GDPR. <laughs> and so, because very few people like knowing that my profile is being sold for advertising. And so GDPR was a shot across the industry's bow. And so the best way to comply was comply with GDPR and every other jurisdiction, you're actually going to be okay. Um, and I, I, I take the same approach with Chia. Comply in the US, you're most likely okay in other jurisdictions. Um, I'm not a fan of forum shopping. You know, Ultimately, like it or not, the winning blockchains are going to have to succeed in the US. It just, in my mind, there's no way that you're going to avoid that. And so got to fight the fight here, got to comply here. And that's really why my focus is on that. So um, at least that's what I tell myself because I can't sleep only one hour a day and, and, and <laughs> all, all the international developments. You're but right. if, if I, because I have to prioritize, that's why I, prior, I prioritize what I do. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, we're, we have so much on our plate here just in the U.S. as attorneys. We can barely become masters of one's niche you know yeah and you're, you're having to cover a lot of different realms of intellectual property contract law all these different things so it is a lot it is it, it really is i mean look startup working in a startup is not for the faint of heart and i mean look you own your own firm so you know what it's like too like yeah. this is not this is not something that normal people should embrace. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting though. It never gets boring, right? It is. It definitely is. <laughs> All right. Um, next question is similar to the last one. Um, there, there's something coming out. Uh, I'm not sure the actual status if it's launched yet. SharesDAO. Are you familiar with SharesDAO? Uh, I have seen the tweets on it. So yeah, so, uh, I just scraped the surface myself and they're they're talking about tokenizing CNI stock among other stocks. 
and my eyebrows raised like this. <laughs> like I don't, I don't know about the legality in the U.S. for things like this. Can you talk about that? How, how that, how you see that? Yeah. Look, um, the legality is uh, that's that's a tough one. It, it's not. So I, my take is, if you are dealing with private company stock. There are restrictions you have to deal with. Uh, you know, either you have to be an accredited investor to 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 be able to get your your hands on preferred stock or private stock initially, uh, or it needs to be you know through through like a certain amount through crowd crowdfunding Reg CF. So there's different ways to get your hands on stock, but uh, ultimately, to get your hands on stock that is not publicly registered, which is stuff that you see trading on the NASDAQ or the NYSE or other, other public exchanges, you, ha you have to have an exemption that you fit under to be able to acquire the stock. And um, if you fit under one of those exemptions, you can, you can actually acquire the stock just fine. Uh, and that's why like, you know, Reg CF is there. If you want to crowdfund up to 20 million, you can. Um, if you're an accredited investor, you know, like a lot of the LPs for venture capital firms, you can invest in private companies, um, you know, or you can do a completely offshore transaction under Reg S. And so there's ways to do it. Um, in this case, I don't know how SharesDAO is doing it yet. I, I've just not uh, delved into the details, but there are different ways to be able to take private company stock and uh, sell or transfer it. Uh, obviously the company, some companies, including Chia Network, might have a right of first refusal on all transfers and sales. Uh, it's typically written into an equity plan for, uh, for 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 equity that's granted through like stock option plans. Um, but you know, it's it's really going to have to come down to the details of what's the transaction and why. So, is it legal or illegal? Um, if you're going to take it and sell it and pretend to be the NYSE, yeah, it's probably illegal. But okay. if you're going to use one of the exemptions, or if you've actually held the held your shares for a certain amount of time, like 12 months, you could, you might be able to qualify for rule 144, which is an exemption to, that you can actually sell stock to another person. Uh, you know, you, have, you still have to keep the legend on it and have transfer restrictions, but you can actually sell that share. And so what SharesDAO is doing, it's, you know, I, I don't want to actually cast judgment on it because I actually think it's kind of interesting. Um, it's very interesting. You know, uh, I didn't know the role of the SEC, if any, if if they would be overseeing the actions of a company like SharesDAO and what they're doing. Possibly, um, and especially if the, the that equity went public, it was was publicly traded, then there would be issues. Um, you know, once you're publicly traded, it's not as simple as just sharing your stock any like selling your stock. I wish it was. Um, you know, there are instruments known as bearer certificate bearer uh, certificates where you can just take a stock certificate. I could walk down to you on the street and say, give me 20 bucks for the stock and I give you a certificate and it's good. Um, we, you know, we in this day and age have moved away from that. Like it's all digital certificates or, or kept on the company's books. And so we have an equity system that we record all the owners in. And if you want to sell stuff, sell stuff, then you actually have to go through a transfer agent and transfer agent has to hold it. And it gets really complex and messy. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the best system. Uh, it, it existed for a reason. I don't know if it's the best system on a go forward basis. Now that we have blockchain, I do think blockchain solves a lot of those problems. And I hope that one day it will solve a lot of these problems. Um, but until then, yes, it, it's very specific. And I'm going to have to put on my lawyer hat and say, ah, yeah, it depends. <laughs> okay. Yeah, these things are very, very complicated. And I think I, I wasn't sure. Where, do you know where SharesDAO is coming out of? What country? I do not. Um, okay. You know, I, like I said, I've seen three tweets um, yeah. and, and that's it. You know, I think as they, as they gain traction, hopefully we'll see more information from them. Um, I just encourage the community to do your diligence. All right. I see a guitar behind you. Do you have a Chia farm in the other corner? No, I do not have a <laughs> Chia farm. Uh, <laughs> you do see a guitar, you know, that's, uh, that's what I, that's one of the things I do when I, I'm not working, which unfortunately is not a lot of time. <laughs> but yes, yeah, actually, you see two. If you you'll see two guitars there. One's a one's a, a small a mini acoustic, and one is actually a bass. Uh, oh, so, cool. 
you know, I have not played bass in a long time, though, to be honest. Uh, but I play guitar because I find it therapeutic and I like it. Awesome. Awesome. Ever in a band or just doing it on the side as a hobby? I uh, used to do it with friends. Yes. Uh, now it's just me, myself and I. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right. So um, earlier you talked about you started off in litigation and liked it. What kind of litigation were you doing? Um, I started off doing securities uh, class actions, actually, oh, uh, wow. on the plaintiff side. So I worked for a plaintiff side firm for my summer between my second and third year of law school. And after I graduated from law school until I got my bar results, I worked at a uh, plaintiff's litigation firm, very, very well known one for uh, the, the, the securities class action bar. Uh, so actually was suing people for securities fraud. <laughs> uh, so I, I've actually played both sides of this. Um, I then moved into kind of a more of a general business litigation. So still did, uh, but more actually corporate and defense side. And so still a little bit of securities litigation, but brought into like IP litigation. So trademark and copyright litigation, employment litigation, contract disputes, you name it. Uh, just general business litigation. So I, I did that for a while. Um, and then I switched into corporate. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So you got your feet wet early um, while you were in law school. It sounds like with the security stuff, the practical side of it. Uh, you know, tried to, um, but, you know, in hindsight, I wish I spent more time on it because look, I never thought I'd be the general counsel of a publicly traded company. Like that was that was originally not my goal. My my original goal was, you know, I went to law school thinking I was going to be a tech company lawyer. I loved litigation so much that I pivoted completely. I thought I was going to litigate, pure, like, just do a pure litigation practice for the rest of my life. So, you know, that's why for the first few years, I was really focused on litigation. And um, I thought that my retirement plan would be eventually just going and taking a government litigator job. And then, you know, earning a pension that way and retiring on that. Like mm -hmm. I, I'd kind of given up on the whole tech company thing. Uh, didn't think I would have a chance to stumble back into it because there's not that many litigation jobs for, uh, you know, in-house litigation jobs in tech. Like th those are very few. And they end up just being basically litigation ma managers and strategists, which is a cool job in and of itself. Don't get me wrong, but that's what, that's what they do. And um I just didn't think there'd be that many roles open. So um, I kind of gave up on it. It was when I pivoted back to corporate that I realized, oh, wait, I can go back to this. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Because when I think about that, I'm just thinking of the biggest companies, you know, Google, Microsoft, we had, you, you touched on the uh, antitrust litigation and stuff like that. So there's work to be done in these huge mega tech companies for sure. Oh, there but, is. There's a lot. It's it's never ending. <laughs> Lawyers have some amount of job security. I don't want to say they have a lot, but they do have some. Yeah. Chat GPT won't replace us yet. No, no, no. It makes up cases. Come on. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Let's see if there's any other. I think we've got a bunch of questions. I don't know if Lori is going to summarize these or we are supposed to look at them. Let's, uh, let's just go through them. Come on. Let's take a look at the time. Let's go. Go through them. Here's a funny first one. Who scored higher on the LSAT? Thomas surprise. I'm sure Thomas did. You know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> let's see. I did not. I actually did poorly. Like for me, I did relatively poorly on my LSAT when I took the real thing. Um, you know, yeah. I, I think I got a 90th percentile. You probably did better than me. I, I remember I didn't uh, really get ready for it. I didn't study for it. It was just kind of on a whim because I was in the tech field myself. I graduated with my computer science degree, was starting to get bored and unsatisfied. And, and then I was looking towards law and rather than like actually work and <laughs> you know, practice the LSAT, I just took it one weekend. Like, oh, it's not, it can't be that bad. <laughs> okay. It's like so, logic puzzles. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yes, yeah, so if you did that, I probably scored higher than you. Obviously we don't know that, but I also don't want to hear like publicly what our LSAT score was. Cause uh, you know, it's not, it's not something I'm proud of either. <laughs> uh, I went to Whittier law school. I, I tried to get into the UCLA or uh, that was my dream school, but it didn't quite land there. 
Yeah. Look, it's competitive. I mean, law school is competitive and yeah. now it's expensive and competitive. So it's even worse. Hey man, it was expensive when I went there. Oof. It was a quarter million dollars just to get through it. Oof. <laughs> yep. Inflation. Right. Inflation is real. <laughs> All right. Next question here is, would you say um, that the Howey test is outdated and doesn't make sense to apply in blockchain? Ooh, the spicy question. Yeah. So my answer is actually, it does make sense to apply for now. Um, so the Howey test is a rather flexible test that was more or less invented by the Supreme Court, um, you know, to try to figure, you know, figure out what the SEC's authority with regard to investment contracts was. An investment contract was defined in the Securities Act, you know, it's, words in there but it's the case law that really gives meat you know really puts flesh on the bones and so the howey test basically says that um a investment contract transaction or scheme is these three or four components uh if you actually look back kind of the history of um the history of markets the history of financial regulation the history of all frauds, Ponzi schemes, you know, get rich quicks kind of schemes. Um, I actually think that Howie was a pretty well-developed test. Um, what it's not good at is giving you an answer to, okay. is my token a security? Yes, no. Like it, it's not good for that. And, and I actually think there's a reason for that. Because if you actually look at all the tokens that are floating around out there, there are tokens that have governance rights and that you know allow you to vote in the DAO, and there are others that don't. There are some tokens that got sold to investors. There are some that, like Chia, were not. You know, so like different factors here are going to come into play into whether something should be considered a security or not. So I do think the Howey test makes some sense because it was it is flexible enough, right? It's not just an investment contract; it's a transaction or scheme, right? So I actually like the word scheme a lot. Um, <laughs> It was meant to basically go and find the next huckster and, and, and to say, give the SEC the power to say, you can't do that anymore. Um, and look, in the 30s, 20, the roaring 20s and 30s, yeah, there were plenty of those too. You know, like human ingenuity in trying to invent new ways to uh, take money away from other people uh, is boundless. And so <laughs> tokens is a lot of this whole token crazy speculation that we see today is just an extension of the stuff that we saw a hundred years ago. Um, and so in that sense, I don't think Howie is actually outdated at all. I think Howie is actually a test that uh, survives time pretty well. Um, what it doesn't do, like I said, is it doesn't give you a whole lot of clarity because you don't just check three boxes and say, yes, okay, I'm good. Like you actually have to delve into, delve into the circumstances and that's a pain in the butt. So yes. that's why many people in the industry don't like it. Um, does it make sense to apply it in blockchain? For now, yes. Uh, and this is where I probably differ from, from many of my, 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 my brethren in the crypto bar. Uh, I do think in the future, we need a digital assets legislation and new set of regulations. I do. Until we get that, and until Congress has actually passed something, which is not going to happen anytime soon, given the way Congress is working now, mm -hmm. until Congress passes that, what we have is securities laws, the Securities Act of 33 and 34, as written. And as written, yes, it makes sense to apply on blockchain. I hope in the future we have a new process. And look, I think we've been very public here at CNI. Chia wants to try to wants to try to blaze one particular trail to be able to work with the SEC to be able to get approval to get our tokens classified a particular way in the way that we think is it should be classified, and then other projects can borrow from that and follow our same path until we're able to get legislation that changes that it really does constitute a sea change for everybody in the future, but we're not there yet, and so uh, you know we can argue about is an eighty year old case almost actually, no, not 80, 90 year old, um, is an 80 or 90 year old case, like 
the right one to apply to blockchain. We could we can argue, you know, till the cows come home. But ultimately, my answer is this is how securities laws today are written. They have to be applied to blockchain because they have to be applied, like it or not. Um, is there more sensible legislation coming in the future? Hopefully. But until that sensible legislation is here, Howie is what we got. And so I know that's not a popular answer. I know that people want a different answer, but until a lot of the dust settles and people really understand like what is involved in certain digital assets, like I don't wanna just say Howie is outdated, let's throw it out, it's terrible. Digital assets are a new asset class. Look, I don't actually believe that statement. And I know that's controversial for me to say that, it's a hot take, but I don't believe digital assets are a new asset class. Because if you think about what a digital asset is, it's a token on a chain of something. And sometimes it's tokenized securities, sometimes it's tokenized commodities, sometimes it's tokenized derivatives, sometimes it's just a stable coin, sometimes it's a meme coin. That's not a new class of assets. It's just a tokenized version of an asset class that already exists. Um, are native crypto tokens, na you know, native tokens to a blockchain different? Yes, they are different, but I don't consider that a new asset class in and of itself. Then you need to look at the underlying fundamentals of that particular blockchain and figure out is this, is this security or not, uh, which is not a fun analysis because then it brings us back to Howie. So um, though that's really how I see the world. And I know that I am bringing a securities lens into that. Uh, not every practitioner is a securities lawyer. And so there are a lot of people who, who, who look at that and, and disagree with me. And they're more than entitled to. Like that's what makes, ultimately it's the debate that's gonna happen that is going to leave us, I think when we get legislation, all that argument's gonna feed into that legislation so that we get something better. Until we have that better, Howie is there. I'm sorry, we all have to deal with it. Chia Network included. <laughs> Very good. All right. This kind of dovetails into the next question that followed that last one. It's, what do you think the impact of the uh, U.S. elections will have on the crypto industry? <laughs> <laughs> loaded. <laughs> it's loaded because, look, at the end of the day, you know, I, I am not a crypto single issue voter. Like, I... Uh, so, noting that, I do think the presidential election will have a pretty dramatic effect on the crypto industry. Um, I think if the GOP wins, um, I do think that, I don't want to say it's business is open and, and we can all do whatever we want. I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think that the crypto industry will get better treatment under a GOP administration than the current administration. I think that the Biden administration today, if it's the Biden administration of the next four years, um, is more skeptical, more, more skeptical of crypto. Mm -hmm. And look, for better or for worse, I don't think that they're wrong to be skeptical of crypto because uh, crypto, look, our industry has not delivered. Um, and much of the other ecosystems, when I look at kind of the ecosystems and what they've developed, it's all basically like ways to develop new tokens and rehypothecate tokens and collateralize tokens and, and generate yield on tokens. And, you know, that, that's, that's not where the power of blockchain is, right? That's, that is one narrow use case of blockchain. Like blockchain is the ultimate settlement layer. It could be the, the transaction layer for the internet. Like this could be, you know, securing, securing all assets. It could be used for identity. It could be used for a whole lot of things. And so like the world needs to see that. And we're just not there in terms of what we as an industry have built yet. So I don't want to say that, that, that the Democratic Party is evil, terrible, twisted. They all have horns and pitchforks. Like, let's, let's not go that far. OK, um, but I do think the, the, the outcome of the election is going to have some profound ramifications for the industry. Um, I think a, a Democratic administration will make will continue to be tough for the industry. I know people are hoping that Gary Gensler will no longer be the chair of the SEC. Look, if Joe, if Joe Biden wins again, um, there's a good chance he will be there. Yeah. But even if it's not Gary Gensler, the other people who are being floated as possible candidates may not be better for the industry. They actually may be worse. So like, be careful what you wish for here. Yeah. Just because a Republican administration wins and kicks Gensler out doesn't mean that like all of a sudden it's business as usual. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I do think the Republicans 
Some of them have been more supportive of crypto and digital assets, but not everyone has. A, a lot of the uh, the GOP are somewhat lukewarm or tepid in their in their approach too. So um, it will have uh, great impact. I just don't know what the impact is going to be exactly. Yeah. Now, my my own personal view is that like crypto and blockchain in general is unstoppable, even if the most powerful governments want to stop it. However. I also believe in the uh, cliche, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And yes. so if uh, the US government decided to really target um, crypto, taxation would be the way if I wanted to kill it. And so I, I start sweating when I see proposals about 30% of your energy burned on mining operations, which could include farming operations, who knows? Uh, you know, that would hurt, that would hurt a lot. So yeah. I, I sweat a little bit on the political side of things here with taxation. Yeah. Look, I, I would, but full disclosure, I don't really own crypto. Um, I know it's weird for me to say that. And many of my brethren get on my case because they're like, how could you understand the technology if you don't actually own any? And I'm thinking, no, you can understand the technology without owning it. Really, it's possible. Uh, but yes, like uh, I am not a huge crypto speculator. It's just not in my risk tolerance right now. Um, uh, you know, as far as I go is I've, I have a little bit in Bitcoin ETFs. That's it. <laughs> so I, w I looked at your Twitter before the interview today and I saw, um, it was prior to you getting hired at Shia, you, you did full disclosure. It was like, you said I was a, a crypto skeptic. I think you called yourself, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. And what, what, that, what do you mean? Crypto skeptic? What is that? Um, I'm skeptical of a lot of what's being built today, right? Look, I mean, I'd rather not name names, but there are people who are building blockchains that can't stay up. <laughs> there are very vigorous communities behind it, huge amounts of TVL locked into that chain, but the blockchain doesn't work. Like it, it you know, it doesn't work. It's beyond the state of the art of, of technology. And um, look, the white paper says VDF all over it, but when you delve into proof of history, it's not a VDF. So like, I'm like, okay, that's no. Um, you know, there are other blockchains that are, you know, there, there's a, a, a there's layer twos that are controlled by a five of nine multi-sig where five happens to be four founders and a director. Like, you know, is that really immutable technology? No, it's not. So like, I, I am skeptical of, of people going and, and and hyping up these crazy tokens and saying, this is the next best thing and we're immutable censorship resistant technology. Oh, it's not, stop kidding yourselves, right? So, um, you know, look, I, I know people think of, a, like people think very highly of Ethereum, you know, obviously our community may not, <laughs> um, but like, you know, of a uh, 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 kind of of the litter, Ethereum is on the better side, right? But if you were at the science of blockchain conference two years ago at Stanford, you would listen to Vitalik talking about how he, how Ethereum is not fully geared up for a long range attack. And his solution was to partially automate, you know, uh, you know, chain, you know, chain resilience. And I'm like, partial automation means partial reliance on humans. Um, and his response to, to, to why not make it a consensus issue was that it shouldn't just be consensus. And I'm like, but that's what a blockchain is. It's consensus, right? So why, why wouldn't we do that? Um, like, this is what the industry is selling. So look, I, I'm not a huge fan of that. And for people to then go and speculate on tokens and drive tokens from, you know, cents to dollars to hundreds of dollars, you know, and then take that token and then throw it into their automated market maker for liquidity or rehypothecate it and take a loan and collateralize it so they can buy more of another token, which is they make some money on and they take that and collateralize it and take it as a loan, you know, take a loan for more of another token. Like this is a house of cards. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for me to look at that just as a normal person and, and, and not think people are going to get hurt here and who's going to get hurt. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's grandma. It's, it's, it's the retail investor, investor, I use in, in, in air quotes, uh, who's going to get hurt by this, right? Um, 
so yes, I am not a fan of what I've seen from the industry. The in, in the you know in the industry, um, look, and sometimes we use the same kind of stuff, right? So like we talk about the idea that blockchain is going to democratize financial services, and I think ultimately it will, but that can't be your leading leading argument for why crypto. But the industry has done that, and you know how many people have been banked to them? Yes, it, you know there are certain regions where it has helped, right? Stellar MoneyGram, I think, was a great use case, right? But are there a lot of those? No, there's not. But there are hundreds of blockchains going around talking about how they're going to democratize financial access. Like, yes, of course you're going to be skeptical. So um, I look at what much of the industry is built. I don't always respect the tech. And uh, yeah, like that's what makes me a skeptic. <laughs> no, like a Bitcoin maximalist would agree with you on everything you just said and say, well, Bitcoin is not crypto it is the king it is the only coin and uh probably when you first got started with bitcoin and reading the white paper uh and you went away from it did you uh, did, did you ever go through a phase where you thought this is just magical internet money this is not gonna like you know reach seventy thousand dollars today <laughs> absolutely look i i i, I would have never in my wildest dreams imagine it reaching a thousand <laughs> i look this, this is back in the days when i think there was a pizzeria that took Bitcoin and I forget how many Bitcoin it took to actually buy a pizza, but it was a lot. <laughs> like, no, I, I, there's no way I would have imagined it being hundreds of dollars even at that time. So 70,000, yeah, no, there's, I couldn't imagine it. Like, I, I'm just not that kind of visionary. Do you, do you view Bitcoin though, like today through a different lens, like how you just described all the other cryptos that have problems? Do you, do you see it differently? Uh, I tend to, yes. Um, look, you know, it, it's not just Bitcoin, only Bitcoin. Um, look, uh, I know it's not, it's not fashionable to say proof of work is great, but look, proof of work, I think is superior to proof of stake, right? It, it works. It, it, works. Uh, it works. It's a consensus yeah. mechanism. It's yeah. heaviest chain. It's actual 51% civil resistance, not 34. So uh, yes, I, 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 I do uh, place Bitcoin and proof of work on, on, on a little bit of a pedestal. So uh, yeah, you know, it's not because I'm trying to figure out how I can, you know, hurt the earth and, and, you know, destroy, destroy the rainforest and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it's as purely as technology, Bitcoin and proof of work is superior to proof of stake. It just is. I'm with you there. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. And that's why I got into proof of space and time because it looked like an improvement on proof of work. And it is, it is an improvement. So uh, that's why you see all those hard drives behind me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's not a virtual background. It's a picture of my real uh, garage. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> I have nothing like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see this next question here. Oh, when you're talking, do you talk to the SEC? Do you have direct engagement with them? Um, I do have some, uh, okay. you know, so yes, uh, limited, but yes. So the question was, how well versed are they, whoever you're talking to in technology when you're talking to the SEC? You know, they are more well versed than they let on, right? I, I think uh, regulators are smart. They ask the Colombo style question. You know, oh, you know, I, I, tell me about this. Oh, huh, I'm not sure about this. And, you know, they'll ask the question like they're dumb, but they're really not. Uh, I think they're actually relatively well-versed in tech. I don't think that they um, are ignorant at all. Uh, they're obviously not going to be as well-versed as Bram. Uh, you know, they're not going to have that kind of level of detail of understanding. But um, look, they, they, they definitely know what they're talking about. And, you know, I, I find they ask really good questions. And so um, I won't detail much of my conversations uh, or the, ch the company conversations because uh, I don't want to talk about the filing process at all. But um, look, you know, I, I, at ETH Denver, Hester Pierce was there and I got a, an opportunity to have an extended conversation with her and she asked really good questions. Uh, you know, obviously she is much more supportive of the technology than some of the other commissioners, but I don't think she is 
unique and special as a unicorn in terms of her understanding of the tech. Like I do think there are others in the SEC who, who understand it as well. So um, the kinds of questions she was asking me leads me to believe they are far more sophisticated than we give them credit for. Uh, Gary Gensler's office hours video aside, which are very basic and meant for general consumption, and which I know many in the industry find annoying. The truth is the matter is I actually think he's doing a great job with his videos because he's not targeting the industry. He's targeting the general public. Um, and the videos actually are bite-sized nuggets and they're relatively entertaining. So I actually think he's doing something right there. Uh, I think we actually need to do more stuff like that in the industry too. Um, but so those videos aside, I do think there's a, a, a good level of sophistication in the SEC. All right. Let's see. Let's look at these next questions here. Um, I think you already said all that you can say about the IPO process. You went pretty in depth there. Um, okay, this is an interesting question. Um, so the questioner says, I assume that Thomas is also driving the SEC negotiations and reporting. Um, any concerns from the commission about pre-farm movement or the loan to market maker? And again, uh, you can't say. Or... That I can't say. Okay. Um, <clears throat> look, I, I wish I could answer, but I, I can't say. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Are either of you planning on buying an evergreen <laughs> a grant? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've thought about it. Um, you know, I've, I've, yeah, I, I met Dylan at one of our community events close to two years ago. Um, and he's actually one of the people who, when I go to community events, I think I run into pretty much every time we end up having great conversations. So, um, Truth of the matter is, I actually have thought about buying an evergreen. Uh, I didn't because I figured I should actually go through the pain of farming myself and actually going through <laughs> the plotting process. Um, full disclosure, I have not yet. Like I have, it's it's on my to do list. I have, as an old IT guy, I have hard drives lying around in boxes too. Um, so like I have a, I have like a 500 gig Barracuda lying around. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it in the trash. <laughs> like I still got stuff. Um, and I always, and I, and I have enclosures, so I actually mean to plot. Um, unfortunately, like my work keeps me a little bit busy <laughs> and then I have kids too. So, uh, work and then, you know, the um, small amount of time I can spare for my three kids, uh, you know, takes up most of my time. So, uh, but yeah, like I, as a result, I have thought about buying an evergreen just so I could say I'm farming. <laughs> I think that's like you're the the target market actually for <laughs> forever. <laughs> I don't have the time that to I have a 500 gig drive. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Dylan, don't hit me up, please. Like you know, I'm already thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, if I didn't have that behind me, I, I would definitely buy Evergreen because it's so cool that they came up with this, you know, plug and play. I came from uh, Ethereum mining before I got into Chia, and that was basically you buy a GPU and plug it in. <laughs> so they, they made you like that. You can just plug it in and start farming. It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, oh, it is very cool. Like I've, I've looked at the, that little green box many times over and think like thought of like, how do I convince Dylan to just give me one? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, let's see the next question here. Do you feel like the IPO market is back at this point in time because of the whole Reddit going well? So, you know, I'm, I'm going to be cautious there. I, I think it is coming back, but it, it'll be a while before the doors are fully open. Um, I think Reddit popped very well its first day, then it, you know, it went up, what, 30% in its first day, 40%, and then it dropped 10% the day after. Um, you know, I'm kind of used to seeing like, volatility in the first six months of a of a, of a stock, stock's life cycle and so uh, i want to i do want to withhold judgment and see how red's doing in like a month or two months uh before i officially say yeah the market's open again um but that being said i do think the markets are improving like this is much better than last year look last year it was only like the biggest of the big that went out right it was you know uh, people who like it, it was basically arm 
and a handful of others that were huge and needed to come out. Uh, Arm, you know, Instacart, others. You know, this cycle, if it's going to be Reddit and others, um, that's a much better cycle, I think. And like, I do think that when value, you know, if there's still demand there and the valuations hold, I think the biggies are going to come out. When the biggies come out is when I think the market's back because people are waiting for Stripe. You know, they're waiting, they're waiting for a lot of these companies have been waiting for a while now. Uh, when we see that come back, I do think that the door is open and it's just a matter of time to figure out how, like how long is there going to be, a, you know, how long does it take for the trickle down to happen? So um, I, I think it's coming back, but I don't want to say it's back yet. Okay. All right. Next question from our Q&A here is, again, this could be one you have to say you can't answer, but what are the legalities of spending the strategic reserve to keep the lights on for CNI? Let me talk about that. Um, you know, so I want to be careful about what I say here because I think the reality is nothing has changed in our fundamental position that because Chia Network Inc., we never originally sold XCH. We didn't sell it to institutional investors as part of our fundraising process. And, you know, we've told, we've told everyone all along, we think it's a commodity as a result, right? If you don't raise money on the tokens, it's not a commodity. Um, we waited 30 months more or less after mainnet launch to even sell some tokens. And 30 months later, we had a high, we had a relatively high Nakamoto coefficient, not as high as it used to be, you know, all the stuff that's going on with all the plotting, but, you know, we had a relatively high Nakamoto coefficient. We were at 190, 100,000 nodes, you know, which is down. Uh, and it's a miraculous number already. Like we are a, def we are a fully launched and operational decentralized network. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there is enough in how I view Howie to think that our tokens are still commodities. Uh, that's really how I how I see it. And so, uh, can do we have the ability to spend or sell? Yes. Um, are we planning to go and go buck wild and see how much we can sell of our strategic reserve in a short amount of time? No, because that would be crazy. Like, uh, you know it is a commercial decision how we're approaching it. And I don't think it's a great commercial decision to figure out how fast we can sell 21 million tokens. That, that would be absolutely nuts. And so, uh, look, we're, we're really taking it day by day and, and, you know, being pretty conservative about what we're doing. All right, good. Um, the last question that came through was, should Ethereum have passed the Howey test? Oh God. Um, So this one's getting really philosophical here. Um, Ethereum 1.0 did not pass the Howey test because it was an ICO. Like just outright, it was an ICO. Doesn't. Um, the question at that point is, do you believe that it's possible for a token, if the network is decentralized enough to morph or shift from being a security to a commodity? And that's a philosophical question. That's actually not one that the law has really answered yet. Uh, and so I think for, for policy reasons, I think it's a good thing, right? So I, I think the idea that you could have a token that starts security, but because you want to emphasize decentralization, and I think decentralization is one of the key value propositions of crypto uh, and of blockchains generally. And so if you want to incent people to build blockchains that are actually truly decentralized, then for policy reasons, one way to incent that is by allowing the tokens to move from security to commodity based on decentralization. The SEC put out a digital assets framework that does say that, but it's not official guidance for the SEC. And so um, the Fit for 21st Century Act, uh, Fit 21, uh, we call, uh, that was uh, proposed by the House Republicans uh, also goes that direction, right? Which is if a network is decentralized and enough, the tokens are out there and they are, they've been 
distributed through fair means, then those digital assets become a digital commodity. And again, so I think the policy for that is right. The question then is, is that the current state of the law? And I don't think there's a good answer for that. If you read uh, Lewis Cohen and DLX's uh, Intellectual Modality of Securities article, which is 200 pages and a lot of legalese, so I don't recommend most people to read in this AMA to read it. Um, it tries to provide some answers, but again, like their argument is, Howie has never referred to digital assets. But the reality is, of course, Howie couldn't refer to Howie. Howie and his progeny case law could not refer to digital assets because we didn't really have digital assets until now. So, like, I don't think that's the right question. Um, and so, you know, people will then, if if you're looking at just pure securities law no morphing theory, no transmogrification, whatever you want to call it, then Ethereum is a security. And th that's kind of where the rub is. There's also some argument that with the move to proof of stake in the merge and the fact that you've now centralized everything, those transactions could be securities transactions as well. Um, I've seen a lot of arguments back and forth on whether that should be a security or not. Uh, that one I'm not really, I don't really want to weigh in too heavily um, just because Ultimately, I already think proof of stake is inferior technology. And so I don't really want to incent the debate on why we should then encourage proof of stake by saying that all proof of stake tokens are automatically commodities. I don't think that's the right way to go either. But um, so knowing that, I don't really want to weigh in on the merge. I do think Ethereum 1.0 was a security. And uh, unless you believe in decentralization as a policy reason, it's still a security today. Uh, that's kind of where I go with this. Um, you know, I know Gary Gensler didn't want to answer that question. Uh, and I know many in the industry wanted him to. Uh, and unfortunately, like, like it or not, the fact that it even took me that long to answer and tell you all, I'm not sure <laughs> how nuanced of a, of a discussion this really is. Like, it's not that clear. Um, you know, the reason why I might give a, like, I personally might give Ethereum a pass is because of decentralization in Ethereum 1.0 when it was still proof of work. Uh, but I'm not willing to say like, I'm 100% giving it a pass. I'm really not sure either. And so that's my view of Ethereum. Uh, it's not as simple as a yes, no. Uh, and this is why, because at some point you're arguing more policy and what the desired outcome is versus what the state of the law is. And at that point, I'm, I am fully on board with the policy outcome, but I don't think the law is there. All right. All right. Thank you, Thomas. Well, I think we you gave us a lot of good information here today and uh, going to wrap it up. But last question, um, if you were going to give like a 15 second elevator speech about what excites you about Shia, what would you tell the person in the elevator? Look, it's, it's really as simple as this. Um, we are building the blockchain that has the capability of being the financial rails for the future. That's it. It is the blockchain that is the most decentralized, therefore most secure. And I like to think, if not the most compliant, one of the most compliant blockchains. And to me, that's just a winner. Um, it's a winner as a lawyer. Uh, and I think it should be a winner for anyone who is coming from a slightly more conservative background, such as the traditional finance industry. Like, what's not to like about that? It's great technology. Uh, yes, it still needs more development, but it's great technology and it's compliant. And you're not destroying the earth while you're doing it. There's not really much more to ask after that, other than is there something better out there? And to that, I don't think the answer is yes. I think we are the best alternative right now. Maybe in five, 10 years, that's not the case. But for now, we are. Full stop. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again for uh, sharing your your story, your expertise with all of us. It was great to meet you, Thomas. And uh, hope we see you on Discord. <laughs> we'll see you on Discord. And look, if people want more of these, maybe we'll have to do another AMA. Yeah, sounds good. I'm sure this just uh, scratched the surface. <laughs> that it did. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks for your time, Thomas. Yep. Thanks so much. And uh, for all of those who actually tuned in, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye, everybody. See you on the Discord.